for the next part of our meeting, as I mentioned earlier, we have an absolutely stellar presentation in store for us tonight. Our speaker for this evening is uh, Benny Jacob Schwartz. He is a naturalist, an international bird guide, uh, and program director for BioCitizen Los Angeles. And he, tonight he will be teaching us about <clears throat> the range, biology, and ecological significance of hummingbirds, as well as some of the best ways to attract them to your yard. So without further delay, uh, Benny, I pass the floor on to you. Thank you, Rachel, for that delightful intro. All of those things are in fact true. Um, and I do actually have a presentation ready for y'all. So um, first off, can everybody see that? You can just nod or wink or something, so I know. <laughs> All right, cool. So how this usually happens is I talk for like 45 or 50 minutes in a conjunction with videos and some rhetorical questions since this isn't really live, um, but I'll keep it to around 45 or 50 minutes. And then if you have questions, what I love is for folks just to throw them in the chat and then whoever's moderating, maybe Rachel or somebody else will like, uh, ask or like we'll read off the questions from the chat and then we can go over those for about 10 or 15 minutes and then any closing remarks that the chapter would like to make or whatever I will yield it to FAS. So without further ado, um, tonight we are indeed speaking about hummingbirds um, and this presentation is entitled The Marvelous Hummingbird from Sea to Summit and I of course your host and hummingbird captain Benny Jacob Schwartz. Now um, I do a couple of things, one of which is nature inspired clothing. So for a long time, um, there was a very distinct demographic that was available, that bird watching was made available to. And I think that that paradigm is shifting rapidly. Um, and I am also happy to push that agenda rapidly forward um, because a lot of young people from, you know, kid like child age to teenage to, you know, even millennials and such, they don't really care so much about nature. There's a huge disconnection happening. And so one of my approaches to uh, uh, attack that disconnection was creating um, clothing that catalyzed the conversation around nature. Um, so kind of a little bait and switch situation, but I think we could all agree that it's a good situation regardless. Um, another thing I do is I offer local bird and ecology walks. So um, this is in the Bay Area. This is at Lake Merritt for folks that are familiar. This is a, one of the largest urban uh, birding hotspots in California. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of folks. Um, something that I was firing up before COVID was another opportunity to, to, to address this lack of connection and providing um, corporate team building, right? And so most people think of corporate team building as like a climbing wall and some, you know, variety of ice breaking and things like that. And so I wanted to take my experience in that world um, and focus it on birds and provide people opportunity to use birds as a mindfulness based approach, um, even in your own maybe business park and tuning into sounds and getting behind binoculars and just having a, a nature moment, um, just the here and now. And I think that during COVID has taught us a lot that there are a lot of amazing observations to be had just in, you know, very small vicinity, right? There's a trending thing called like five mile radius where people uh, try to maintain local patches within a five mile radius of their home. So I'm doing a lot of things um, in relation to birds um, specifically. And then I'm also a full-time program director for an outdoor education nonprofit here um, in Los Angeles called BioCitizen. Um, and we do a variety of things. And in my free time, <laughs> I give presentations about birds. So what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird? Tonight, we're going to start broadly, um, and then we're going to dive into some more specifics. So <clears throat> oh, and then by the way, all the photographs and media in here is mine unless otherwise uh, credited. So what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird? So is it their evolutionary history? Is it their distribution? Is it perhaps their role as pollinators, their flight? Is it their size? Well, tonight we're going to find out which of those questions is true. So. As we can see here, there are a lot of different hummingbirds and coincidentally, my background is hummingbirds this evening. And in general, there are over 360 different species of hummingbirds. Now, what's so fascinating about hummingbirds is that they are all found in the Western hemisphere. 
So conveniently, I found a map of the Western Hemisphere, and I wanted to provide a little bit of context around this, around the biodiversity, okay, because hummingbird biodiversity was not created equally. In Canada, we have five, obviously there's aberrations and rare birds, but all things being equal, we have five species of hummingbirds that you could effectively see in Canada, um, around 27 that you could see in the US, um, and that number jumps significantly as we get to Mexico. Um, and now as we dive into Central America, it gets even better. So the numbers go from a small country like Belize um, with 22 species to um, places like Costa Rica and Panama um, with extremely high uh, biodiversity rates as well as obviously very high um, hummingbird rates. Um, so <laughs> it gets very serious when we get into South America. Um, and so I'm not going to read all of these, but you will quickly see that these numbers are serious. Colombia holds it down with 165 species of hummingbirds, um, Ecuador with 133, Peru with 125, Venezuela um, with 99, Bolivia 79. And as you can see, um, each of these countries have quite a significant number of hummingbird species. Now, the reason for that is that hummingbirds in in their origin, they're tropical species. They came from the tropics. Um, and over time, as the climate warmed, um, their range expanded. And so we're going to dive into that a little bit later. But I just wanted to lay the groundwork for understanding how crazy the biodiversity rates are um, in the New World or the Western Hemisphere, and that South America is pretty much the crown gem if you want to see a lot of hummingbirds. So now we talk about the evolutionary history, right? Because hummingbirds are indeed extremely unique um, amongst all birds. And so as you see here on this cladograph, you can see um, that we have tree swifts, we have swifts that we generally see here in North America, and then we have hummingbirds. And so um, these actually split at apodiforms, and then it goes to apodi, and then it goes to the whole family of hummingbirds, trochilidae. Now I'm not gonna bore you with evolutionary history, because this is not an evolutionary history class, but it is important to provide context so that we can fully understand the magic of these birds. Now, <clears throat> the evidence um, was actually found in a fossil that's 52 million years old in Europe, and it basically was conclusive evidence of this common ancestry between swift and hummingbirds. Um, and again, I'm not going to go crazy on the details, but long story short, there were some anatomical features um, that were consistent um, across these two species, across these two groups of birds, across swifts and hummingbirds, um, including like the tarsus length, as well as um, the number of bones found in the wing. Um, if you want to find more about this, um, you can check out this paper by this individual whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, alrighty, so now we're going to dive into some sp uh, specifically spectacular traits. So sexual dimorphism. Um, and there's definitely a lot of ecology terms in here. And so I'll define um, as many as I can. So sexual, obviously gender-based and then dimorphism. So two forms. So basically across the sexes, we are observing differences um, in individual species. And so on top, we have a booted racket tail. This is a male. Um, you can see this is an Eastern Slope Andean, Andean bird because it has the orange tufts as opposed to the white. Um, but regardless, this is the male, this is the little lady. And on our right, we have um, a male ruby topaz. And below, we have a female ruby topaz. And so you can see the colors are uh, significantly different. Um, and that is predominantly for camouflage, since um, female hummingbirds spend most of their time, or spend most of their, most of their responsibility is on incubation. So they want to camouflage and blend in. And so this is the case for um, most examples of dimorphism in birds. So another fascinating thing about hummingbirds is that they are specialized nectarivores, okay? So that they are highly um, adapted to specially feed on flowers nectar. Um, this is Cape hunting suckle, and this is an Allen's hummingbird in spring here in Southern California. Another thing is that they are co-evolved with ornithifolious flowers. Now that is a mouthful, and that basically means bird-loving flowers. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. And this is, of course, the sore-billed hummingbird. Um, and so in here, you can see this is a cross-section of one of the flowers that this hummingbird visits. Um, and so what's interesting is that 
there's two main things that are happening here. One is this is where the pollen is located on the flower. As you can see, it's held within the corolla or the petals of the flower. And then at the base of the flower is actually where the nectar is hidden. And so the plants and the flowers have evolved over time this coevolutionary relationship, meaning that the beaks got longer and the corolla tube has also gotten longer to basically create highly specialized relationships across two different species. So this sword-billed hummingbird is specifically adapted to um, accessing the nectar in a very few um, number of flower species, but the flower species are uniquely, have unique morphology so that as you can see, <laughs> that beak goes perfectly in here. And so um, along the way, the hummingbird gets doused with some pollen and the flower gets its needs met. So when we talk about the tropics, there are 7,000 plant species pollinated by hummingbirds. Now, if we compare that to North America, that's a measly 125 species pollinated in North America. However, if we recall back to um, overall hummingbird biodiversity rates, we could extrapolate um, probably pretty easily that this is actually proportional to the number of species found in these regions, given that there's such high biodiversity rates in tropical regions. Alrighty, so now we're going to dive into a little bit about hummingbird biology and to hummingbird adaptations. So a little food for thought. If our bodies ran the same way as hummers, we'd have to roughly eat 1,300 sandwiches a day. Now, I have a pretty fast metabolism, but it does not even herald in comparison to hummingbirds. Well, all right, they need a lot of calories, but really, ultimately, what do they eat? Well, folks, I'm glad you asked. Well, I think it goes without saying hummingbirds consume a lot of nectar. Now, that is not the only thing they consume. And this is a male tufted coquette from Trinidad and Tobago. And as you can see here, there's a little bit of like a pollen ring around the, bill, the bird's beak. Um, and some of these strategies for uh, consuming nectar are as follows. So one of which is territory defending. Oopsies. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see a hummingbird perched um, claiming its territory on a plant like this. This is a California native. This is bladder pod and it blooms year round and uh, the hummingbirds mark their territory and chase off other hummingbirds. Another adaptation that hummingbirds use to uh, get their calories is called trap lining. Now this is a behavior most commonly observed in tropical regions. Um, and one of the most uh, conspicuous examples of this is the white tipped sickle bill. And as you can see, it has a very uniquely adapted bill. And so the difference between territory defending and trap lining is that instead of um, locating predominantly on one bush, um, trap lining birds actually have a route. And just like the male person has a route where they deliver their mail, um, these hummingbirds have a route throughout the forest where they visit a variety of different flowering plants. And so maybe they have 20 different um, plants or stops that they hit and basically they go from A to B, C to D, and then by all the way around the circle. And by the time they get back to A, the nectar reserves have uh, replenished and they can hit those flowers again. Oops. Alrighty, so here's an example of another um, trap lining species. This is a green hermit in Trinidad and Tobago on a heliconia. So we have two, we've already talked about two examples of uh, nectar consumption. Another example is invertebrates. Um, most people actually forget that hummingbirds consume things other than nectar. So here's a short clip from tracyportraits.com. And if you look closely, boom, he teed up right, she teed up right on that little insect and snatched it right out of the air. Boom. So this behavior um, is observed often during breeding season as these birds actually need to increase their caloric intake because they have a lot of energy demands raising and rearing their young. Um, but they don't just eat small gnats, they also consume mosquitoes, ants, gnats, and aphids. So now is actually a great time to observe this behavior. Um, and sometimes you'll actually see hummingbirds hawking insects out of spider webs. Um, and in this case, this hummingbird <laughs> became entrapped. So keep your eyes peeled. Sometimes you'll see hummingbirds um, hovering under eaves or staircases um, and they're tweezing around in there and they're actually hawking insects. 
All right, another very clever adaptation is piggybacking on the hard work of other birds. Now, this is a red-breasted sapsucker or sapsucker SP if you wanna get crazy, but tonight we're gonna to call it a red-breasted. Um, and this is obviously a eucalyptus tree and these small little bullet holes are actually, um, I'm sure folks who observe these in trees, these are actually uh, small holes that have been excavated by this bird. And as their name alludes to, they consume um, the sugary substance called sap from these trees. And what happens is the hummingbirds will actually cue into these and uh, hit these sap wells, they're called. And we'll have some video footage of that in a little bit. Now, as we continue on our journey talking about their amazing um, biology and adaptations, um, we of course should talk about their amazing flight. So here's a video I shot at UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. As you can see, this is not a California native. This is a Banksia from Australia, but nevertheless, this male Anna's hummingbird has found it. So watch closely and see if you can understand the magic of what allows hummingbirds to stay in flight. So that last section was slow-mo and now it's actually back to regular speed. So for those of you who are itching to answer the question correctly, um, you are right. And actually the hummingbirds are so unique since they can fly in 360 degrees. It, the reason for that is their wing strokes are actually generating lift on the downstroke and the upstroke. So they're actually able to hover simultaneously while they're flying. So pretty unique and special. It's kind of like a figure eight or like an infinity sign uh, turned sideways. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about within their adaptations is their tongues. Oopsie daisy. So as you can see here, this hummingbird tongue is crazy long. It's at least as long as the bill. And this is, of course, a white neck Jacobin. And we have a little bit of a video clip explaining how unique this adapt, how you how this unique adaptation actually functions. So I'm going to fire this up. And this is, of course, sourced from PBS slash KCET. So take a look. Speed macro photography, we see something truly new. Hummingbird's long tongues have four tips that open as the tongue dips into the nectar. fringe of tiny filaments uncurls along the edges of the open tips, creating grooves that spring open, filling the tongue with nectar. It's a structure science has never seen before, and it's an incredibly efficient technology for picking up a liquid. was Alejandro's resourcefulness and the painstaking work he began. So pretty sweet. Alrighty. So the next thing that we have to think about is adaptations for sight. So they've got the flight dialed in. They have this amazing um, lift giving wing pattern. And how do they see, right? How do they navigate, right? If you've ever been to the tropics or maybe you've ever been in your backyard um, or in a nearby open space and you saw a hummingbird just like zip in and zip out and they're extremely agile and uh, precise flyers. And that's because of their vision. The vision plays a huge role in their hummingbird feeding and their hovering behavior. So the key words here is high retinal neuron density. Now, what does that even mean? Glad you asked. Um, clinically speaking, the retinal neurons serve to transform the optical image to extract biologically relevant info relating to light intensity changes, um, changes in time, and changes in chromacity. So basically what it's saying here is that um, these retinal neurons basically uh, convert or translate what the eyes are seeing into uh, basically data that the brain can, can basically navigate within. So it's happening at a very high speed. And so retinal neurons are basically one of the reasons that hummingbirds are able to uh, see and navigate. So 
as we dive into the next section is energy requirements and metabolism. So we talked about this, right? They need to eat a lot of food to maintain their energy. So while in flight, they actually have the highest or the fastest metabolism of any animal other than insects. So here's some hummingbirds shot on my DSLR from Tandiapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador. The next clip is um, some white neck jacopins from my GoPro on uh, with the frame slowed down. And then here are some more, as you can see, uh, booted racket tails. And these are Western Andean birds as they have the white boots. This is a uh, shot actually on my iPhone in slow motion. So as you can see, they spend a lot of their time flying around. Um, and so talking about this on a physiological level, their heart rate is actually possible of achieving over 1,200 beats per minute and over 250 breaths per minute. Now, this, uh, these stats are actually observed specifically in blue-throated hummingbirds, um, which their range venter, ventures into, excuse me, the southern part of uh, Arizona in just a few places. And this is actually where this bird was photographed. So when I'm explaining things, <laughs> It's all great to hear the numbers, but ultimately it's really important to have tangible takeaways, right? Things that relate to things that we understand um, or that are relative in our own lives. And so if we think about oxygen consumption per gram of muscle tissue, right? Because that is a factor, right? We have to respire so that our muscles um, have enough oxygen. And so when we look at this, Hummingbird oxygen rate per gram of muscle tissue is 10 times higher than an elite athlete. This is Usain Bolt going crazy even, and he's an amazing athlete. However, hummingbirds actually consume 10 times more oxygen per gram of muscle tissue. So how do they maintain this metabolism? I mean, that seems like crazy. It's such a high energy requirement. Um, again, we go back to science here and the answer is direct oxidation. And what I mean by direct oxidation is that um, the sugar that the hummingbirds consume in the form of nectar is actually converted into um, a biologically consumable form called ATP. Now, if you remember back to your high school biology, that stands for adenosine triphosphate, which is basically animal sugar. Um, and it can be converted in up to 30 or 45 minutes. And so hummingbirds need to feed often to maintain their metabolism. So the thing is this sugar um, or whatever their calories are being are, are made up of doesn't always have to be burned off immediately. It turns out it can also be stored as fat. So I'd like everyone to meet the ruby-throated hummingbird. Hello. And the next few frames are from my buddy, Sean, who's um, folks might've heard of. He's um, a fantastic photographer and bird bander researcher, conservationist. You can check him out here um, at Gourmet Biologist or Wild Bird Research Group. And I had the opportunity to work with the Wild Bird Research Group back in 2013. And I learned a lot about ruby-throated hummingbirds since I'd seen them before, but I didn't really know a lot because obviously I live in Los Angeles and we don't get those birds here really. So this uh, large orange oval is actually kind of a rough estimate of the range map of the ruby-throated hummingbird. Again, a rough estimate. Now, like I said, they actually can store their calories in the form of fat as opposed to burning it off immediately. So we're gonna look at the migration path of the ruby-throated hummingbird. So this orange is the breeding area. And in the winter time, it actually migrates across the Gulf of Mexico through 500 miles of open ocean. And it makes its way after crossing the Gulf of Mexico, usually landing into the Yucatan Peninsula, and then makes its way south across central, down Central America and to the site of our study project this evening to the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. Now, here's an in-hand photo of a female ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, these birds are captured safely using all permits and um, safe handling procedures. And we attach a little bracelet, whoopsie daisy, we attach a little bracelet on their legs. And that bracelet has a unique serial number. And anyone who's familiar with banding or ringing, if you're from the UK, um, it's used to monitor and track the birds over time. And 
oopsies, hold on. And basically, um, when we recapture the birds, we can check the bracelet and see when this bird was banded. And it turns out that this female here in the photo was actually banded three years prior to the photograph, meaning that this little hummingbird has undergone this journey, um, this has undergone this round trip journey three times and has made the single leg journey um, at least six times. And so the journey is pretty fantastic. And it's pretty amazing that a hummingbird that's only a couple grams could fly there and back again um, using, gas, using fat stored on its body, just like we fill up our car with gasoline, we can go however many miles. The same thing is true for hummingbirds. Now we're gonna examine one more migratory species in a land not really known for its hummingbirds. Now, if you're recognizing some of the fauna on this page, you could probably guess where we're going next which is Alaska. Um, I spent a couple summers guiding out here in Alaska and it turns out there are hummingbirds here. Now there's actually only one species of hummingbird who I'd love for you all to meet. This is the Rufus hummingbird. Now the Rufus hummingbird is what we call in the bird world a long distance migrant. Now what that means is pretty straightforward. This bird travels a substantial mileage from its breeding grounds through its migration route to where it spends its non-breeding or winter season. Now, in this case, the Rufus hummingbird could fly up to 4,000 miles from its wintering ground in Mexico to its breeding grounds in southeastern Alaska. Now, if you forgot what the Rufus hummingbird looked like, it's here again. Now, what I wanna highlight about the Rufus hummingbird is this uh, coevolution, this very close relationship with two special flowers, uh, one of which is called colloquially the Indian paintbrush. Um, its genus is Castileja. Um, and the species I'll be talking about today is just one. Um, there are many, many um, species of paintbrush or Castileja. Um, and so on here is actually a range map of this uh, species of paintbrush. And so you can see in a moment that there's something very special happening here. Now, what I'm gonna overlay on top of that range map is actually the range map of the Rufus hummingbird. So, whoopsie daisy. So as you can see here for review, this is the range map of the paintbrush. And then as you can see, the range is actually almost identical, especially in Alaska. And so what that means here is that these these two species um, actually couldn't survive without one another. And so as temperatures um, were more favorable for range expansion, um, over time the Rufus hummingbird and the Indian paintbrush or the Castileja species um, and one other flower expanded slowly up north until we have reached its present day range. So in summation, this Rufus hummingbird is an awesome long distance migrant. And when it gets to Alaska, like I said, sometimes it's not as peachy it is here in California. Um, and so it has to deal with a variety of uh, environmental challenges, especially during inclement weather. Um, and this photograph was taken probably around this time, two years ago in Alaska. And this isn't even the Arctic part. This is like, you know, um, the Kenai Peninsula. So it's actually pretty moderate temperatures on the Kenai. But regardless, um, during inclement weather, hummingbirds have to be able to last, right? They're tropical species, but their range has expanded so far north that they're actually getting, um, they're, they're so far north, north that they have to have unique adaptations to survive when it gets really cold. So there's something that we call um, nighttime torpor. So um, some folks are familiar with the idea of hibernation, which in essence is basically when it gets cold for a consistent period of time, like a season, um, an animal will basically uh, turn down its met metabolism and its internal um, heat and just kind of crank it down so it's like base metabolic rate is functioning. Um, we can get into that another time, but at any rate, hummingbirds basically do the same thing, but it's over a much briefer period of time, and this behavior is called torpor. Um, and during torpor, hummingbirds can actually drop their resting body temperature from 104 degrees to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So obviously, um, when it's running cooler, um, it doesn't consume as much calories. So it basically puts it on 
energy saving mode. Your phone is like, oh, you're at 20%. Do you want to turn on energy saving mode? And you're like, absolutely. I've got the rest of the day ahead of me. So the same thing with the hummingbirds, um, when they hit, when they uh, encounter inclement weather, they can basically engage in nighttime torpor. All right. So this co-evolution that we talked about between the Rufus hummingbird and um, Western columbine and Indian paintbrush is actually found in many other plants in North America. But what I find most fascinating is that these plants and these flowers aren't depositing pollen in the same exact location. As you can see, we have four different types of flowers. We have fuchsias, ocotillos, pinks, and chuparosas. Um, and each of these flowers are actually depositing pollen at a different location. Um, and so you can obviously imagine that um, in this case, the flowers want to make sure that their pollen is put in the same place so that it doesn't get mixed up with the pollen from other flowers, um, thus increasing the pollination eff eff effectiveness of hummingbirds. Um, this is sourced from the great David Allen Sibley in his awesome text, The Sibley Guide to Bird Behavior. Now, I took you from the sea and now I'm going to take you to the summit. So we're going to start talking about high elevation hummers. Um, and this is in Ecuador. This is in high elevation. This is in uh, just in Paramo, it's called. And hummingbirds have to deal with a whole other slew of environmental challenges here namely low atmospheric oxygen. So if you've ever gone from the Central Valley and you've hoofed it up to um, montane forests or subalpine or even alpine, you, I'm sure that you can realize very quickly that there's um, more challenges here. You get out of breath, your heart rate increases, and that's because there's a lot less oxygen available at higher elevations than there is closer to sea level. So Let's take a look at this fiery throated hummingbird photographed along the Sierra, Sierra de la Muerte highway in uh, central Costa Rica. And these hummers are found up to 9,000 feet in elevation. And if we look at this awesome chart, we can see that at about 9,000 feet in elevation, the amount of effective oxygen that's available is roughly 14.8%. So if we uh, scale it back to sea level, you can see that there's roughly 21% of oxygen available. So we went from roughly 21 to 15 in 9,000 feet. Now, this is under the altitude category of high. And as a frame of reference, Aspen, Colorado is around 8,000. So the next one that we're going to talk about is the rainbow bearded thornbill. Now, these, thorn, these hummingbirds are amazing. And um, if you could see the rest of the frame, there's basically um, not a lot of vegetation in this landscape above like waist high. And this bird was actually photographed on the ground um, and they're found up to 12,000 feet in elevation. So if we refer back to our handy chart, um, we can see that at 12,000, the effective oxygen drops down to 13.2%, um, which is close to on par with the height of Mount Baldy, which is the highest mountain in Los Angeles County. And the next one that we're gonna talk about excuse me, is the giant hummingbird. Now, if there was a northern cardinal perched next to this bird, these birds would actually be roughly the same size. And as you can see here, this bird has a very interesting morphological uh, proportions between its beak and its body size. Um, and these birds are actually generalists. They're elevational general generalists, which I think is mind blowing to me because these birds are found at sea level and almost up to 15,000 feet. Now, if we refer back to our handy chart, we can see that um, at 15K, there's only 11.8% of oxygen available in the atmosphere. Now, this is pretty freaking mind blowing. Like, how do they go? How does a giant hummingbird, the same species, how is it able to live at sea level and at 15,000 feet? I mean, that is just crazy. Humans can do it, but hummingbirds, come on, that's just crazy. So, you're probably all wondering, how do they do it? Well, direct observation and scientific inquiry can answer a lot of those questions. Um, and it turns out that it has to do with hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin in these uh, high elevation hummingbirds is actually different than the hemoglobin we have. The hemoglobin that these hummingbirds have it actually has um, higher oxygen binding properties. So hemoglobin basically is found within red blood cells and hemoglobin binds to free oxygen. And all right, so you're probably all wondering, great, but I live in California. What is up with hummingbirds in my state? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now, 
I live here in the city of Los Angeles, um, but I have it under good authority that a vast majority of you folks live in this general area, which luckily is still in California. So we can still reliably see uh, six hummingbird species in California, and one of which is the Anna's hummingbird. And this is a male. This was photographed up here in the Angeles National Forest um, in the San Gabriel Mountains. Another one that we see here in California is the Allen's hummingbird. And another one that we also get in California um, is the Rufus hummingbird, which we touched on heavily. Um, here's the Calliope. Here's the black chin like we talked about. And here's the Costas. So we'll review these real quick, just so you can um, think about ID tips. So the Anna's hummingbird is probably our most common hummingbird in California, depending on where you live. But for the most part, the Anna's is the, is the most common. Now the Anna's, a quick way to identify the Anna's is that um, it has an almost all green back and the males have this kind of fuchsia magenta gorget and then the females have mostly clear colored feathers um, and then a little kind of central spot here. Um, this obviously the foci of this presentation is not exclusively on hummingbird identification, but we will touch on it a little bit. Um, another example, again, is the Allen's hummingbird. And so a lot of folks get tricked out between the Allen's and the Rufus. And in for with taking broad strokes, the Allen's hummingbird between and back side. Um, and again, in rough string birds, almost have an exclusively black um, This looks like it is near a riparian area, potentially even in Alaska, because this is uh, looks like some salmonberry or a rosaceae. Here's the calliope. This is actually, I believe, one of the smallest hummingbirds in the world and maybe the smallest in the United States. Um, it's just a little bit larger than the bee hummingbird. So that's also a good giveaway that you're looking at a calliope. It's very small. Female and juvenile hummingbirds are a whole different world in and of themselves. So the best way to ID them is obviously seeing a male, but again, we could get into that a later time. But this calliope basically has striations in its gorget. Um, it's not complete, as you can see in the rufus um, or in this male anise hummingbird here. There's actually gaps where there are not iridescent feathers here. So this is a great way to identify the calliope along with its very small size. Um, here's the black-chinned hummingbird. As you can see here, it's got more of like kind of a lavender purple colored uh, gorget and it doesn't have the flaps on the side. Um, and then here is the Costa's hummingbird, which is in comparison to the black chin. So you can see a little bit of the difference. The black chin doesn't have um, white auriculars or a kind of substantial white around the eye. And the gorget has kind of a generally rounded shape that doesn't have kind of a side flap of iridescent feathers. And within direct comparison to the Costa's hummingbird, we do see this kind of a little bit of a white eyebrow here um, and then kind of white behind the ear here and then you can see those kind of flaps, so to speak, um, like I was mentioning. So those are our six that we can readily see. We have the Annas, the Allens, Rufus, Calliope, Black Chin, and Costas. Now, I'm obviously passionate about conservation and with, incre with exponential increases in urban and suburban development, um, we've lost a lot of habitat. Um, anyone here who spent a significant time outside over time has probably seen the vast swaths of development um, engulf maybe some special places that were near and dear to your heart. However, hope is not all lost. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can actually bolster um, native birds, native insects, native plants, and just as many people say space is the final frontier, actually our yards and our open spaces adjacent to where we live are the final ecological frontier. And what I mean by that is that since these places have already been claimed, the, there's no really palatable argument of, oh, we need to like remove all this development, put back nature. That's just not gonna happen. It, it, the, economics is not built that way. But what we can do, but what we can do is bring back the natives, okay? And so that's a huge, I'm a huge proponent of native plants and native plant ecology. Now there's a huge misconception 
um, that native plants are lame, that native plants are not cool, that native plants are not pretty. It turns out those are just misconceptions. And the most fascinating thing about native plants is you can actually plant native plants that bloom all year round. And I will drive home this idea that it is important to not only plant California native plants, if you have the opportunity, it is important to plant regionally appropriate native plants. Some native plant nurseries will source um, plants from the Channel Islands here in Southern California, um, but those plants actually are, at, are a detriment in some ways because they're watering down local genetics. I, I, whatever, I'm not gonna get crazy, but plant regionally appropriate native plants. And uh, we, we can talk about that during the Q&A if you have any uh, interest in that topic. So then following plants are generally found blooming from January through March. Um, so we have these Gracioleraceae, these Ribes, this is a golden current in the Allen's Hummingbird. Um, and then we have uh, this Ribes malvasium. Um, this is a uh, pink chaparral current. These were uh, flowering about a month, a month or so ago here in Southern California. And the berries um, are just starting to happen. Um, next up, we have cacti. So um, in my region, we do have cacti. I'm not sure if you guys have cacti native to Central Valley, but regardless, um, these are some beaver tails, some opuntias that have some beautiful blooms that hummingbirds are attracted to. These are all native plants that hummingbirds love. Um, another one are monkey flowers. Um, this genus got exploded. Whoops. Okay. We can ask questions later about that. Um, but the monkey flowers are gorgeous. Um, they're very well adapted to California climate and they come in a variety of different colors. This is the most common, the orange bush uh, monkey flower, sticky monkey flower. All right, now we're getting into the true summer here in the lowlands or also in the highlands as well. Um, these are salvias um, and there's a wide variety. Um, up top, I think we have either purple or Cleveland sage, and then we below that we have this hummingbird pitcher sage, um, which is actually really well adapted to growing under the shade of oak trees. So that's a great companion plant um, for oaks if you like those, which you should. Um, some penstemons, these are cool. This is a heartleaf cacalia. This is a SoCal plant, but as you can see, these red tubular flowers um, are basically calling out to hummingbirds. Um, here's another penstemon. This is um, showy penstemon, penstemon spectabilis, I believe. Um, and we get into some thistles. So not all thistles are European invasives. We do have a couple that are native to California, including this bull thistle. Um, and hummingbirds do like these as well. Um, another great one are snapdragons. This is the island bush snapdragon. Um, let's see what we got next. Okay, so you may be thinking, wow, those are beautiful plants. But Benny, I don't have any space to plant. I say, no problem. There are still things that you can do for hummingbirds. Um, so, uh, whoops. Yeah, so you can get a hummingbird feeder. These are great ways to bring the beauty of nature uh, close up. Um, and this is actually, excuse me, this actually achieves two functions. One is you can see the hummingbirds close up and, okay, I lied, there's three. So one is you can see hummingbirds close up, secondly, um, these attach to a window. So even if you live in a smaller dwelling, like an apartment or something like that, or a condo, you can slap these little suction cups on the window. And then you can fill this little tray up with water, which is like an ant moat. And then this little thing pops out of here and it opens and you can fill it with nectar. And then thirdly, it serves to um, demonstrate to other birds that the window is actually a window instead of open space. Because as we know, um, bird collisions with buildings and windows are actually one of the highest um, factors in bird mortality rates. So stack your functions, as we say in permaculture. Now, I have some amazing recommendations for you, and it does not include this first nature hummingbird nectar. Um, but maybe you're at the local pet food store and you see this red nectar mix and you're like, wow, that's a really handsome ruby throated hummingbird. And you read all the information and maybe you're you're a big fan of America, which I don't blame you. And it says made in the USA. And you're like, oh my gosh, I want to get that. But then you decide not to for some reason. And you're at Petco getting a custom um, pet collar for your dog or whatever. And you look over and you see this beautiful bottle of single use hummingbird nectar. And then you're like, oh man, that red, I want to I wanna buy that. But then 
but then something hits you. You remember this amazing presentation you received from Benny Jacob Schwartz. And then you think to yourself, he said no red dye premix. And he said, there is a solution, folks. The solution is actually make your own solution. And this recipe that I'm going to share with you was passed down from my great grandmother to her great grandmother to her great grandmother, and then to me. Now, this solution is actually 20% nectar solution, which means of all the five parts, one part sugar and four parts water. Okay. So when I first read this, I was a little bit confused, but it makes sense. So 20% is one fifth. And so of all the five parts, you should add one part sugar four parts water to give you five total parts. Now, um, you don't have to boil the water. You can um, totally use pretty warm water and mix the sugar and the water together and um, shake it up to dissolve the sugar so it's evenly dissolved. And then one important thing, especially as temperatures are increasing during the season, um, make sure to clean your hummingbird feeders frequently. Um, hummingbirds like their nectar fresh and they definitely don't like the fermented um, sugar that turns into alcohol. So that being said, that is the terminus of information I provided in a slide-based format. Um, if you're curious about what I do when I'm not presenting, you can keep up with me um, in a variety of ways. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and I also have some cool little YouTube videos um, at Birds by Beegis. And my name is Beegis. I'm Benjamin Isaac Jacob Schwartz. So to keep it simple, I put Beegis. Um, all right. Oh, last but not least, where to find native plants in your area? It turns out um, I had a little bit of a challenging time finding them. Um, so if folks have any uh, other native plant nurseries that you hit in your Central Valley area or within the Fresno region or the Western Sierra foothills, um, we'd love to throw it in the chat so folks can get some native plants. Um, and native plants are a great way to uh, combat this massive extinction of species we are experiencing globally um, and think locally, act what is it? Think globally, act locally. And one great way I think is this Takeo or Takao nursery. Um, and they have um, some California native plants, which are ultimately the only plants you should be thinking about planting if you are a bird fan. Um, all right, enough of my agenda. I'm going to open it up and stop my share um, with anyone who has some questions or thoughts. All right. Well, um... Benny, we do actually do have a few questions in the chat, so um, uh, you can read them off or I can read them off to you one by one and you can just um, address them. Would you like to do it that way? Yeah, would you read them for me, Rachel? That'd be great. Perfect. All right, let me just pull them up here one by one. Just scroll up a little bit. Uh, let's see. Um, someone asked uh, what hummingbirds do when it isn't a uh, blossom season. Mm. That's a good question. So like we talked about, they have, um, they can supplement their diet in a variety of ways. So they'll probably turn to, like we saw two things. One is sap well, so they can drink sap when it's available and they can also uh, predate on small invertebrates like insects and things like that. Okay, awesome. And the next question is, that is 20% by weight, right? Um, 20% of their, they consume 20% of their, their caloric value is 20% of their body weight. Is that, is that your question? Okay. I think that's what they were referencing. Oh, the question is 20, 20%. Linda says this. Yeah. So for the sugar mix. So, yeah. So. Yeah, so what I would do is like if you were going to have five cups of solution that you were going to make, throw in one cup of sugar and four cups of water. Okay, perfect. And then the next and then, question. And then some people, oh yeah, sorry. And then some people ask like raw sugar, organic sugar, all that stuff, honey. Keep it simple. White refined sugar is uh, what all bird professionals recommend. So keep it simple. Um, it can be organic cane sugar, but they don't want raw sugar and they definitely do not want honey. Okay, good to know. Let's see, we went down to the next question. Um, okay, for anyone who's not reading the chat, um, one thing that should be added is that a good place to 
purchase uh, native plants that's near Fresno is an Intermountain Nursery in Prather. So just uh, just a little note for anyone who's not um, um, reading the chat. Um, let's see. Okay, a question for Benny. At times, hummers have hovered close to me and appear to be looking over me and my dog. Can you talk a little about this behavior and what the hummer is visually perceiving? I think ultimately the question is, what kind of dog do you have? <laughs> That's a joke. Um, already, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard with the virtual audience because it turns out yeah. people think I'm funny in person. Um, no, I'm just teasing. All right, Nancy liked it, amazing. Um, so <laughs> Barbara though is not pleased yet. I'm just teasing. All right, so looking over me and my dog. So I think <laughs> I would have a hard time surmising an accurate uh, evaluation of what the hummingbird is observing. Um, sometimes hummingbirds are curious, right? Like they're animals as well. And there's a lot of behavior and things that we don't understand. I think that, you know, one short story I could share is like, I'll go out into my yard and I'll see that my hummingbird feeders are miraculously empty because the hummingbirds stay thirsty. And I went out and changed the hummingbird feeder. And literally as soon as I changed the water, they all just like come down. They're like, zzz, zzz, then they're all like chattering, chattering. So the overarching statement is hummingbirds are they see a lot of things and um, they obviously have high visual acuity. So they can, they're just like, I don't know how to say it simply. They can see everything. Um, and so maybe your t-shirt that you were wearing that day had like a floral print on it. Um, I know other birders have reported like wearing floral prints or orange colors in the field and hummingbirds will like zoom right at them. So if you wanna see hummingbirds, maybe uh, especially during migration, throw on some floral prints when you're out birding and you might just pick up a rare, a rare hummer. Um, all right, we see one from Susan Joy. What do you think about going birding in Columbia in the near future? I think a lot about it, honestly. Colombia has like the highest bird biodiversity of any country in the globe. I think it's like roughly 1900 species. Um, I think that Colombia is going through a very hard time right now, but basically before COVID and before this quote hard time, um, I think that Colombia was actually very safe for birders. Um, so yeah, I would be down. <laughs> I'd be very excited to go to Columbia once things cool down a little bit. Good question. Looks like uh, the next question is, why not raw sugar or honey? What happens to them if we feed them honey? Amazing question. I do not have an answer for that. I could look it up, but... Um, it probably has to do with like the type of sugar. So sugar is an umbrella term, um, but in honey, I don't know if there's any like a uh, microbiologist or like a nutritionist here, but if you are, feel free to correct me. But basically sugar is an overarching term, right? So there's glucose, there's fructose, there's sucrose, there's all these different iterations of basically like a sugar molecule. Um, and so I would presume that the hummingbirds are not able to readily break down those other forms of sugar that are found in raw sugar or honey. Um, and so I think that is probably the closest to the answer, closest answer. And then Judy also wrote, honey can have botulism spores. So that also is not great. Uh, Benny, just uh, going back to one of the earlier questions, um, Barbara did acknowledge your joke and said that it was funny and wants you to know that it's an Australian herding dog that she has. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> hummingbirds love Australian herding dogs. People just, that's just a thing. So if you like hummingbirds, get Australian herding dog. <laughs> uh, Nicole would like to know, uh, when is your next trip outside of the U.S.? Um, amazing question, Nicole. Well, I'm actually probably going to the Amazon in Ecuador in September. I'm actually building a small eco lodge in the Amazon with a birding guide friend of mine in Limon Cocha, which is very close to a harpy eagle nest. So we'll be offering um, a lodging and professional guiding services um, out of the Amazon probably in the next like a month and a half or so. So I'm going down there to see what's happening <laughs> on my project. And then next domestic trip, I'm going on a pelagic trip in San, out of San Diego on Saturday. And then I'm going up to Washington for to do some scouting up to the Orcas Islands. 
And then I'm going to Southeast Arizona for like a handful of days at the end of May to pick up some new birds for the United States. So always be birding folks. Nice, nice. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I think you touched on this one in your uh, presentation. Uh, how do Hummer's wings lift, uh, I'm sorry, how do Hummer's wings generate lift on both upstrokes and downstrokes? Okay, great question. So basically what's happening is if you think about it like this, so the hummingbirds, the slow motion, the flight is like this. So if you've ever treaded water in a pool with just your arms, for example, just doing this, you can actually generate lift doing it up and down in the pool or like a jacuzzi or whatever. So that's effectively the same thing that the hummingbirds are doing with their wings. They're creating lift on the upstroke and the downstroke so that it's, I, I, again, I'm not like an expert on this topic, but that's the, the basic idea is that this is the motion. So when they're flying, it's going like that, that it's pushing on the air the whole time so that it keeps them up. Can you talk a little bit about Hummer's mating dance? Some in my yard fly inc incredibly high and dive straight down Then a loud beep sound as they pull up just short of the ground. Barbara, amazing question. Okay, so basically what happens here is this is indeed a mating ritual. This is performed, I think, exclusively by the males and it's often in terms of like territory. Um, so they'll, males will like do that display to other males and they'll also target females. Um, and so different hummingbirds have different basically patterns. Um, I believe the Anna's hummingbird is the flight pattern you're describing where it goes all the way up and then it comes all the way down crazy fast and then it like breaks off right at the end. Um, and so that beep that you're hearing is actually um, the wind hitting the tail feathers of the hummingbird and it's creating that sound. Um, and the Allen's hummingbird, if you ever observed a similar thing, it'll do a J flight where it'll go straight up and then it'll bomb back down and then it'll do this like zing, 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 and then and then come back down and jing, jing, jing. So uh, different species of hummingbirds have different flight patterns, but it's basically just like a guy would go to a gym to get really buff to like show off to a girl if that was what a girl was looking for in terms of sexual selection or a female, whatever. Um, basically the same thing is happening with hummingbirds. They're demonstrating their, uh, what we call in ecology, fitness. How long will they rest at night before they need to eat again? Um... How long will they rest at night before they need to eat again? Well, I think it depends, right? They can basically turn themselves off at night to a pretty low metabolic rate. So I would say like in my personal observation, they're, they're based, hummingbirds are feeding during the daytime. So they're obviously able to persist for 12 hours without food because in tropical locations, um, it's basically 12 and 12. Obviously there are slight aberrations in this, like whatever seasonally dependent, but in general, hummingbirds will feed all day for 12 hours and then they'll sleep all day for 12 hours. So they're totally good after 12 hours. And the biggest thing here in the tropics is that the temperature is almost uniform. Um, obviously as you get into higher elevation, it's different, but um, across the board, the temperature variation is very minimal. So the energetic requirements to maintain their homeostasis um, is much less stressful than it is in places of a northern or southern latitudes outside of the tropics. So, um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Susan wanted to point out um, regarding the question about um, honey, honey results in fungal infections leading to the bird not being able to use its tongue and it will die. So that is not great. We definitely want to avoid that. That's great. And I am not seeing um, any other questions at this point, but I am seeing a lot of very positive comments about your wonderful, wonderful presentation. Well, I obviously am super grateful and it was definitely an honor to go after Lowell. And like I said, I love the Sierra. I love the work that y'all are doing. And you know, my biggest, my biggest push is like leveraging our privilege in the United States. I've traveled to a lot of places that don't have the same type of assets that we do. So I encourage folks to continue to leverage our privilege, whether it be through educational and volunteering um, or through like financial contributions to uh, awesome NGOs that are putting in the work on a ground level. Um, because I dive into this topic more in my Tropical Birds presentation, but 
um, these migration paths that we see, these 4,000 miles, right? They're only able to achieve this, A, because there's stopover sites, and B, because their wintering grounds still have adequate uh, like, and, like caloric resources in the form of plants and animals available. So if you want to continue to protect birds, continue to leverage the privilege that we have and invest in awesome organizations that are um, doing on the, on the ground work to support habitat, um, empower local and indigenous communities to uh, continue to conserve these really important areas. Awesome. Well, thank you, Benny. We actually do have uh, two uh, last questions here. Sure. Uh, Barbara wants to know, uh, do hummers reuse their nests and is it advisable to remove an apparently abandoned nest? Um, that's a good question, Barbara, with the, with the bangers. Um, do they reuse their nest? I think in general, humming, I think in general, maybe like 75 or 80 percent of birds do not use their nest um, year after year. There's a variety of reasons beyond the scope of this presentation, but in general, I would say just leave it be. Um, I don't know if folks have any other like professional experience on this topic, but obviously open to it. But I would say just leave it, um, especially for as leave it until the end of the breeding season. If you wanted to remove it and have it as like a little souvenir or put it in like a display type situation to show other people, I obviously support that. Um, but one thing that is interesting, like if we take, if we think about woodpeckers, for example, they're what we call ecosystem engineers. And so they're the ones that are doing the primary excavation in snags and trees to create holes. And so um, even though they may not reuse that same hole again, maybe a chickadee or a nuthatch or another species um, or a Western bluebird, for example, might um, need that nest hole. So um there's there's definitely <laughs> form drives function and vice versa so i don't have a specific answer that's your call but definitely after like the breeding season is over there's more flexibility in doing something with a nest okay uh, all right awesome so we have one last question here so what are your thoughts on this i have a hummingbird so super true super territorial and does not allow any other hummingbirds near his feeder I have a male human visitor. Um, the hummingbird is also territorial, even aggressive with men and also with female friends. The hummingbird kind of shows off. What are your thoughts? Oh man, I think that hummingbird needs to talk to a psychologist because it sounds like there's some underlying trauma there. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think that is very peculiar. Honestly, that is uh, what we would say in, sp in Spanish, like the hummingbird's muy bravo, um, which is like very like territorial or like aggressive. Um, it depends on what you want. Like in some cases, mostly people are worried about their other hummingbirds getting access. Um, so in places where multiple hummingbird species ranges overlap, the Allen's hummingbird like often over often outcompetes the Anna's hummingbird, even though it's significantly smaller, the Allen's in respect to the Anna's. I um, mean, so what I do is I usually um, it depends on what you want. Some people just put like a stack of feeders within like a couple meters of one another so they can focus their observations there. Um, I usually spread mine out so that the hummingbirds can do more of a trap lining and so that there's less uh, territorial like aggression. Okay. Um, and special shout out for awesome. anyone, well, special shout for anybody who brought their family tonight. <laughs> I appreciate that. St educate them younger the better. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Benny, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and this was incredibly informative and it just, just awesome. I absolutely loved it and um, definitely learned a lot. And I'm telling you, everyone, if you're, if you're on Instagram, uh, you need to follow this guy. His handle is Birds by Beaches. His content is very educational, very informative, and very, very entertaining. So yes, definitely follow this guy if you are on Instagram. And Benny, I definitely hope that we can, I know we had initially scheduled you for uh, January of 2022. So I'm hoping that we can still book you for your um, Birds of the Tropics presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we call it because because feathers of light. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, awesome. So yes, we'd, we'd definitely love to partner. have you back for that. Y'all let me know. Awesome. I'm for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll definitely be in touch about that. Awesome, cool, cool. And um, to uh, Lowell, uh, Deanna, and or, um, Andrea, thank you again. Um, and for everyone who attended, uh, thank you so much. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you're not already, please follow us on social media. Fresno Audubon is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's a great way to 
um, kind of stay in the loop about upcoming events, uh, field trips, general meetings, and things of that nature. Uh, thank you again, Benny. Thank you again, um, Lowell, for your contribution to the creation of the Southern Sierra important uh, bird area. That is just amazing. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that as um, a lover of the Sierra and a lover of birds in the Sierra. And um, yeah, thank you again, um, Andrea and Deanna, for um, you know really kind of giving us a thorough explanation of that. That was awesome. Thank you again, Benny. And everyone have a great evening and we will see you next month. Stay safe out there, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night.